Do any of you have a favorite character death you've written in your illustrious careers? On the, at the end of Battle of Bastards, when Sophie sticks the sticks the hat, uh, you know, on the bastard, she does a walk away. You don't really actually see the death. You see some of it in the background, um, but you don't really see the death. But what you do see is Sophie's smile uh, or Sansa's smile. And it was all in one shot and we did it, you know, seven times or something. And I just remember standing there with Dan and when she finally got like she nailed it on the seventh or eighth time. And it was just that feeling of like, that's such that's so epic. I mean, Sophie was so good. And when she when she got that shot, I just felt like that's I can now die happy. Prepare your ears, humans. Happy, sad, confused begins now. I'm Josh Horowitz and today on Happy, Sad, Confused, what happens when you combine the brains behind Game of Thrones and True Blood with a beloved modern sci-fi bestseller? You'll have to check out the massive giant swing that is Three Body Problem on Netflix to find out. I am thrilled this show is bringing these three very talented men to the podcast for the very first time. Is It's executive producers and showrunners for Three Body Problem. It's David Benioff. It's Stevie Weiss. It's Mr. Alexander Wu. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for having Thanks, us, Josh. Jeff. Great to be here. Uh, congratulations on the show. I'm sorry I missed you guys in South by. Uh, I know you. I hopefully you fill you fit some barbecue, some tacos uh, into your promoting your beloved show. N not enough. Never enough. Yeah. Never enough. Uh, talk to me a little bit about. Look, we're taping this like about I guess what 48 hours, 72 hours before the show drops. Who's the chill one in this trio? Who has the most anxiety to balance each other out? Is, is there a chill one? There's a whole table full of pills next to me that I'm not showing you. <laughs> I think we need a chill one. That's why we need a yeah. fork. So there could be like, you know, the Beatles. <laughs> That's what we're missing. We're missing. We lost. We need a Ringo. We forgot the Ringo. We <laughs> always bring the Ringo. Alex, that wasn't your job to come in to help these, these, this duo out and chill them out? That wasn't part of the deal? No, if you've seen my medicine cabinet, that's not my job. <laughs> yes. I guess you are the chill one by virtue of the fact that you have even more pills than I have on the table that I'm not showing. <laughs> Compare this to me for me. Look, you've been through some very um lauded, um, um uh you know, dissected shows in your careers. Before the, the days before True Blood and Game of Thrones came out, did you have similar good butterflies, bad butterflies? Can you compare and contrast for me at all? Yeah, I, I was terrified personally. I mean, um, when the first episode came out of Game of Thrones, Dan and I were, so that was back in the time of actual TV ratings, you know, and, and Dan and I were on a scout. We didn't know if there was going to be a second season, but we had to prep one just in case. Mm. And we were scouting in Croatia, right, Dan? Yeah, we were with, with Strauss in Croatia. We were scouting with Carolyn Strauss, who was, had been the president of, of HBO and she was the woman who we pitched the show to her and Gina Balian and uh and then she became our producing partner and when the first episode came out we didn't know how to read the ratings because we hadn't worked in TV before but Carolyn the Harvard educated um you know former president of HBO she obviously knew ratings and so she looked at the numbers and she said Oh wow, that's incredible! You guys, we got we got was it eight million people for the first yeah. for the first night? Was, it was just as a, as like Boardwalk Empire was like the biggest show that they had in the air, and their pilot, I think it was Scorsese directed pilot, had gotten seven million viewers uh, according to this whatever metric she was reading off of. So yeah, so for about nine minutes, we were the happiest guys in Croatia, and then Carolyn said, "Oh wait a second, <laughs> I, I got that wrong. Two million, two million people." <laughs> What? So it was a quarter. The number was a quarter uh, of what we thought we had. Yeah. And uh it went from and I was like, yeah. I was like, how did you how did you make the mistake? But how did you multiply this exaggerated by four hundred percent? And she just said, I never know how to read these things. And I'm like, you ran the network through its <laughs> its golden age. Like you were in charge of the Sopranos and the wire and Deadwood. She's like, Yeah, but I, I never knew what these numbers meant. Luckily, there was no anxiety in the years to come. You had no anxiety in the rest of your run on Game of Thrones. It was just a chill experience. So, mm -hmm. all good. After Very that, relaxing. Yep. <laughs> are, what is your all your relationships with fandoms at this point? I mean, Alex, True Blood had very passionate 
fans were you were you guys always talking about how the fans were receiving it and kind of like did fan the did fan reaction ever influence what you guys were doing on that one yeah it grew over time so i mean true blood ran from uh 2008 to 2013 and even the power of fandom increased over you know over that period and and then you know David and Dan can speak to to you know Game of Thrones. I mean, it's just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. The first show I worked on, which uh, Brian Fuller just posted something that it was like it's the 20th anniversary of Wonderfalls, which was my first job, mm-hmm. and uh, which is incredible to think that it was 20 years ago. But that's a show that if if there were fandom that could go on the internet and and like evangelize to other people that was one of those shows and it didn't and and then he created dead like me which is sort of like in, in many ways spiritually very similar to wonderfalls but i always thought like if there were a fandom there that could that could speak to the outside world that would have yeah it, it could have had a better life than it did uh true blood i think it was very very positive at the time you know uh the, from the very beginning. And I think it was a kinder, gentler time, yeah. <laughs> at least, you know, in the, in the first few years. Um, and, uh, you know, now like everyone has a voice, everyone has an opinion. And often, you know, the louder your opinion is, the more attention uh, you get. Uh, so, you know, I, I think we're the beneficiaries of a time when, when people were, uh, were, uh, 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 I, I think a little bit, uh, a, a little bit gentler on us yeah. uh, with maybe the exception of like television without pity, which I love, by the way, I, I really did uh, uh, love television without pity, uh, you know, introduced, you know, some snark to it and some, uh, you know, and and uh, some fair, or unfair sort of critical, you know, uh, uh, critical viewing, which, uh, you know, uh, there there are benefits to it, but also adds to the the stress level for those of us who make the shows. Sure. And for you, for you gentlemen, what is your relationship with fandom and critics at this point, having been at the very extreme, unusual circumstance of I mean, very few shows? I, yeah. I will say that, like, to this day, I really enjoy, like, meeting people in person and, like, having an actual human interaction with somebody. It's almost always positive, even if it's somebody who is critical. It's a different kind of a vibe when you're talking to a person face to face and i've i've always enjoyed it even even the critical stuff in person i don't we don't do i'm for reasons of like design and intention like we kind of stay off not on any social media and and don't don't really engage online the main reason being that just once that was kind of starting to ramp up I think I, I don't know the exact dates, but I kind of the subjective feeling was that as Thrones was starting to take off, so was engaging on social media, and we were we were the oh, very much the beneficiaries of of that, like in a in a big way. So it's you know it, it's kind of hypocritical, I think, to to complain about the negative side of it when you benefited so much from the positive side of it. But I just bet in positive or negative, it was really just more about the amount of time it took to engage with that. It was very obvious to both of us from the outset, a tremendous amount of time that we just didn't have. I mean, making a show, Thrones was, it it sounds like an exaggeration, but it was, we were, it was slightly different. It was on a more or less day and date release schedule, April 17th to 25th, somewhere in there every year, you would come out with the first episode of the season. And to do the job in that time frame was, it was like, it, it was 364 and a half days a year, which sounds like bullshit, but it really wasn't. It was, it never stopped. And it felt like the time we had to like spend with family and friends was already like a yep. very narrow life's margin. And as soon as you added onto the top of that Jenga tower, well, what if we dip our toe into this, then the whole thing would have fallen over. And so we never got into it. And I don't, I don't think I ever really will. It just feels like I always wondered as a younger person, I was like, what will someday make me feel like an old person? 
and this is this is it this is like the old <laughs> this is where i like crossed over the old person line where i'm, I'm just not going to do this thing that i know even like my parents are probably thinking about doing at this point i'm think- not going to engage with it I think for your long-term mental health, it's probably the wise decision. As much as you want to engage, look, look ILUV Daenerys 300 million <laughs> has a lot of important things to say on Instagram, but you've got a life to live. I love it. I would love to meet him, her, they in person and and like talk about what they have to say. That's that's great. Right. But it's just the, the online version of it. It just kind of feels like maybe it's a giant psych experiment involving several billion people that I kind of want to see how the experiment plays out before I, uh, yeah. before I engage. Yeah. Good luck to all of you. Well, look, speaking of psych experiments and se- segueing into a little bit more directly three body problem, uh, science fiction realm. Um, can we talk a little bit about our sci-fi influences growing up? I mean, did all of you, all of us, did any of you grow up? Were you Asimov readers? Were you Arthur C. Clarke? Were you, um, you know, debating wow. the meaning of 2001 in your college dorm room. Give me a sense, David. If I were in a different, if I were in a different yeah, room, yeah. I could I could point my my camera at all the like old paperbacks in the in the plastic uh, cases. But this is the wrong room for that. And what were, who who was the author of most of those paperbacks? Who was your favorite? Who I loved the most as a kid. I loved Robert Heinlein. And yeah, I, I was, was going to say Heinlein over Asimov yeah. and Clark for me. Yeah, Philip Philip Dick was also probably yeah. that was my single biggest was probably philip dick and vonnegut i know like i'm not sure i think he counts i always counted vonnegut david were you gonna uh, add something yeah Von, vonnegut no no, no. I, was, I was gonna say Heinlein. i for whatever reason i never got into asimov like i tried and and uh you know if somebody could tell was incredibly smart probably had like 190 iq and i just never never care about any of his characters yeah and so I was probably more of a, I don't, soft science fiction sounds really lame, like, like soft rock, but you know, whatever, <laughs> but not. But both of them are awesome. The so less pejorative yeah. uh, description of sci-fi that's not considered hard sci-fi. It was probably more of my thing. Yeah. Um, science fiction. What's it? What is it else? Yeah. Science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Happy, Sad, Confused is sponsored by Better Help. What's the first thing you'd do if you had an extra hour in your day? Would you go for a run? Would you sleep a little more? Would you visit a friend? Would you read a book? Most of us spend our lives thinking about having extra time, but the real question, the real question we should be asking ourselves is time for what? What would you use if you had unlimited time? Therapy can help decide what to use that time for, what's important in your life. I've benefited from therapy, friends have too. If you're looking to start therapy, BetterHelp is there for you. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient and flexible and suited to your busy schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. Plus, they have flexibility. Think about that. You can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Therapy is invaluable in these stressful times. Give BetterHelp a try. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with better help. Visit betterhelp.com slash HSC today to get 10% off your first month. That's right. Better help. H E L P.com slash HSC. Give therapy a try. I grew up in the 80s, and and, and there, there was some good sci-fi films then. Mm-hmm. You know, that's obviously around when, like, James Cameron kind of came into his own, mm-hmm. and we're getting Alien in the late 70s, and then Aliens, of course. Mm-hmm. But on the TV side, it's kind of slim pickings. I mean, ironically, mm-hmm. I think, and I don't know if you'll take this as a, as a compliment or not, like, a, a, a miniseries that had a big influence on me was V, which yeah, I could I could us, us too. We talk yeah, about V all definitely. the time. Oh, God, yeah. I, I love was obsessed with V. I, I read was, the novelization of V when I was a kid. I believe I did too. I think Kenneth Johnson wrote it. I think he uh, did yeah. it also. Um, so yeah, V was this crazy 80s miniseries that has some huh. similar touchstones to this. Did it come up in the writer's room when you were putting this together at all? Oh yeah, it definitely came up. And, yeah. and you know, I think it's, we were talking earlier today about, you know, you don't necessarily see the aliens in our show, 
but there was that great moment in V, I think, where her skin oh, yeah. gets torn, if I'm yeah. remembering correctly, yeah. and you see like the lizard skin beneath it. And uh, yeah. we'd make jokes so about it, like Jess, Jess tears her skin, uh, Jess uh, tears her skin, Jen, the character on the show, and there's like lizard skin beneath. But there was also, if I remember correctly, there were like the capos back, you know, in, in V, who the humans who yeah. sided with yeah. the, um, and they made a pretty obvious like comparison to the actual capos. But, but, uh, yeah. You know, that came up when we're talking about the, the various humans who decide to align themselves with the uh, with the Santi invaders. Um, and yeah, I mean, V was V. I was obsessed with that show when I was a kid, back when you actually had to be there at the moment it came mm-hmm. on. And, you know, um, it, it was, but yeah, there were a lot of great movies. And, you know, E.T. was was getting to show my kids E.T. finally when they were old enough was a great moment as a dad. I mean, it uh, was kind of cool about yeah, science fiction. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. No, go ahead Dan, please, oh, yeah. I, I mean, it was kind of cool about some science fiction on television back in the day was that what was being written about was so completely unachievable visually. There was just right. absolutely no way to put Isaac, most of Isaac Asimov on the screen back then. There's no way to do Robert Heinlein on the screen back then. None of it. So a show like The Outer Limits, which was, I mean, such a huge influence on Cameron and so many other people as well, like really needed, it, it needed to find a different, more thoughtful, conceptual way in to telling science fiction stories, which it was, a, it was such serious limitations put on what they could and couldn't like manage on TV. But I think those limits sometimes like... Sure confinement makes for higher water pressure you know like i think it really did kind of make force them into a smart place because they couldn't they couldn't do anything big expensive cheap you know blowing stuff up sort of gas twilight zone i mean we talk about twilight zone a lot lot of those episodes are a lot of them are you know overtly sci-fi and some of them are Mm -hmm. kind of you know on the border between sci-fi and horror but but uh again yeah like taking advantage of the limitations and using that to create a sense of atmosphere and paranoia. And what's the episode that you um, we were talking about the last week? Yeah, we Dan? just, we just watched, uh, I just the other night watched uh, the monsters are due on Maple street with Claude rains. Um, and a uh, guy who's named Jack Weston, which is, I mean, it has to be, I think maybe the best one. Well, there, there are all these like possibly confined almost bottle episode things right yeah. like obviously the william shatner it's, episode on the plane yeah but that's, another, that's like i mean one. they're all like very actually contained stories that yeah. just have very clever brilliant writing i mean on the flip side i mean again segueing to what you guys have done here this is it's, look you have limitations you can't you can't not have limitations but what are yeah. the limitations for something like three body problem which obviously has sizable budget um, and and a lot of advantages that those folks way back when didn't have like what are you butting up against that's that's spawning new ideas. Well, I think we're taking advantage of the same. You mentioned V, and then we talked about the Twilight Zone. You know, those those were both shows that took advantage of uh, of of some of something that television can provide that 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 is different from film. Um, in that it's an intimate experience it gets under your skin and then that's the that that's what made v so scary to me as a kid mm-hmm. was that i was kind of alone in the mm-hmm. living room in the dark watching this thing that was that with the screen was like maybe a couple of feet from me and you know there was that that's a very different experience than say star wars for example sure. you know, um I, and and V took advantage of that. Uh, it seems so simple to us now, but like back in the eighties, this was not like this. This was not a, 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 a an immediate realization. And Twilight Zone, a lot of the a lot of the really sort of truly horrifying, frightening modes are because it's so like it's so intimate. Yeah. And uh, so when we're making uh, this show, or when you know Dan and David made Game of Thrones, and even to an extent when when we made True Blood. These were shows that have a lot of spectacle to it. There's a lot of bells and whistles, but at the heart of it, it's something very intimate that happens to characters, and and that's like that. That's still what we we hold closest to us. That's at the center of everything, of everything we do, because all the bells and whistles and all the, right. all the craziness is not going to matter unless you care about who it's happening to. Mm-hmm. And that's that's you know, one of the great strengths of television is that you really care and engage with these people for maybe up to a decade of your life. And and 
if you don't care about it, all the big explosions, you know, aren't going to aren't going to matter that much. That being said, uh, stay till episode five, just for the for the I, for the big stuff. <laughs> and and that big stuff, I think, matters more because by that point, yes, you care about you can. the people who are responsible for it. No, but it's it, it's it's a million percent true. Obviously, look, uh, you'll, the from Game of Thrones getting you know all the attention for the the effects and the battles and the dragons and all of it. Uh, uh, you guys know way better than I do. It's the characters that everybody became obsessed with. It's the same on True Blood. Vampires are o- always going to be cool, but it's the characters that you're going to be you're going that are going to stick with you. And I think about like you know quote unquote first contact stories, which this essentially is, whether it's ET or Contact or Close Encounters, those are very human grounded stories. That's mm-hmm. the commonality, I guess, right? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, those like uh, Close Encounters to me, I, that, that's one of those ones that I saw like when it came out in the theater and I trying to remember how old I was. I was, I must've been like eight years old. Yeah. And, and yeah, that was a, that was a, was a first contact story. And I didn't realize at the time that it stood out from other first contact stories as not being about how we're going to, how, what, what kind of a weapon we're going to use to destroy them or blow them out of the sky, but like a much more nuanced, like involved, even sort of quasi religious engagement with the idea of what happens when something bigger than us comes from up there, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, but it, it made a huge impression on me. I mean, it was, it was that those jaws and that were the, and star Wars were really the most formative movies for me. From the time and you I think about really with, with, with close encounters, I mean, Alex, I think it was you who made this point last night when we were talking, one of you two guys made the point about patience, you know, the beginning with, with beginning is like not, not mm-hmm. rushing it. And there's something when you watch close encounters again, and just kind of remembering how long it takes to get into the story, like how patient Spielberg was with how yep. he developed the characters, how he, you know, showed you like the goodies with, you know, whatever alien stuff was going on. It's all very patiently done. And, and because of that, like it's, it's doesn't feel nearly as dated as some science fiction movies that came out 30 years later that, that Mm -hmm. just feel like they were really exciting and fun when you saw them in the theaters in, you know, 1996. And now you look at it, it's just like, Oh, that's just kind of crappy effects and a, and a kind of a boring story. So, uh, Something, you know, for me, like Richard Drive is just just losing his mind with the mashed potatoes is way more yeah. exciting than, than yeah. you know, a flying saucer zooming by. I will also say when I was watching this, the show begins. I mean, I always think about the opening of Close Encounters and like the juxtaposition of like, what film am I watching? Where am I? And you're seeing like what those like World War II bombers and like, I feel like the desert or something in the opening scene. And similarly, in, in, in a different way in your show, I'm watching the opening scene and I'm like, I'm where am I? 1966 China? Like what did I click on the right button? And there's something yeah. really special about that. There was actually kind of a it, it's a pretty it's funny because I didn't it's so burned into my brain and like who I am that I didn't even the fact of like the close encounter starting in that piecemeal way where you're taking all these disparate strands and you're wondering like how do these things all weave together? I kind of get what it's about, but I don't know how they all put together into a coherent whole like that actually is pretty similar to the way that this show yeah. starts out especially in the first like uh, two or three episodes did look the last few years have proven uh, perhaps that any of us that were pollyanna ish and, and thought like well you know when a global existential threat comes around, we're all going to unite and we're going to sing Kumbaya. We're going to figure it out. <laughs> and sadly, apparently, uh, pandemics, climate crises, you name it, uh, we're kind of fucked. I don't know. I don't want to be. Maybe too those things like just, maybe those things just aren't big. Yeah. Sorry, That's your David, conversation you're having, David? We, yeah, we were just talking, talking about, about something similar. Uh, uh, sorry, I know I'm, sometimes I'm looking like my uh, mom when I'm. And I'm FaceTiming with her, like I, I know it's getting just like just my schnoz right, right in close up. But uh, yeah, literally like an hour and a half ago, we were talking about this how the three of us started planning the show and talking about story and everything on on Zooms while we were you know locked up in our separate houses for eighteen months or whatever it was during the pandemic, and and watching the world not come together in any meaningful way to combat this threat to the entire species and. Certainly, we've seen over the years the failure to come together in a meaningful way over global warming and over, 
you know, uh, international conflict, whatever. It, as you say, it's very hard to be Pollyannish about it. And I think it did inform, you know, not only just the skepticism about that, but also the skepticism about people's faith in science and, and how, you know, there, there is a large part of the populace, maybe even the majority of the populace that just doesn't really have much faith in science and doesn't really believe it when scientists in mass say, this is happening, this is real. Um, you know, this temperature, the fact that temperatures are X degrees warmer now than they were 50 years ago, that's, that's a real thing. Um, a lot of people just don't buy it. And so that, that informed a lot of the decisions in terms of the writing, you know, there's a giant eye in the sky. We all see it. It's up there, but a lot of people aren't going to buy it or they're going to think it's some kind of conspiracy. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking to a guy whose, whose wife has worked for the NRDC the last 17 years. So I've, it's been a, it's challenging to say the least. Um, really impressive promo by Netflix uh, mounting these congressional hearings into aliens, et cetera, the last couple <laughs> of years. Well, well done. Whoever is uh, making that happen. Um, yeah. where, where are you guys at on aliens? I'm, 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 Kind of a disbeliever, but are, do we have any believers here? Any? Well, I think they're definitely out there somewhere, but like it's just a question of how are they going to get here, not in the show, because I think we, uh, Sashin Lu did a very good job of explaining exactly how they're going to get here and how long it's going to take them. But I'm not sure in reality that works. I'm not a science not a science professional, so I, I can't really speak to that. It, I think it's a very solid, very solid science fiction. I don't. It, it seems like uh, even four light years away is a hell of a long way to go. So that are they out there? I think almost certainly there are many days out there all over, and there are trillions of planets in the, in the universe. But are they going to actually make it here? That uh, that I'm a little bit more skeptical about. So. Look, this show, I think I said in the beginning, like uh, I, I I always love big swings and this is a giant swing. It's a giant ensemble. It spans different time periods. It's it's uh, you know, it's it's heady stuff. It's challenges an audience. What felt like to you guys the biggest swing? Like we were like, we're really going to we're testing the audience. We're going to push up against it. And this may or may not work. What felt like you were out on a limb? Just wanted to go full Dave Kingman. <laughs> um, <laughs> baseball uh, reference? Yeah. Wow. Wow, he missed wow. a lot more than pure baseball. Uh, <laughs> it's a low uh, batting average for Kingman. A lot of dingers, though. A lot of home runs. Swing. What was the biggest swing? That's a good question. I, I mean, I, yeah. I think anything that is that is conceptually just like hard to even get your head around, right. no matter how much time you have, is going to be a huge challenge to put on screen where hopefully it all flows in front of you and and you know you don't have to press pause or look up a concept so uh you know we we do a huge explanation about higher dimensions in in, in this show which you know was iterated many many times but that is a really hard thing to to bring across in a way that you can digest as it's being explained to you. Right. Uh, luckily, we were the beneficiaries of of uh, two great uh, science advisors, and also u- utilizing uh, uh, utilizing not just the information they gave us, but the way they explained mm-hmm. it to us uh, in a, in a way that we could all understand. Um, and, and uh, there's also other people who, who, who are on YouTube, for example, you know, and, uh, and explain science to people who aren't scientists that I found really, really useful because that is, is how, you know, we have to convey a concept like, you know, 10 dimensional objects, you know, in a three dimensional world. Uh, those, those are hard things to try to, uh, try to tackle uh, it, i don't know if that answers it whether it's a big swing but it was a big thing to tackle sure sure well yeah i mean well, the, the 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 other th- one of the other things that i feel like you all have commonality in in your work is you look you love um writing great characters you also love killing off great characters it, spoiler alert everybody does not survive to the end of this <laughs> first season um do any of you have a favorite character death you've written in your illustrious careers? Favorite death. It was fun. It, with Thrones, we, it was so much killing of, of good guys that when we finally got to really kill 
both Joffrey in season four and Ramsey Bolton in season six. It was fun to to go back to the old fashioned kind of joys of just killing off a really bad guy. Right. That, Once that actually had it coming as opposed to. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't get it felt like it was maybe balancing the scales a little bit. So that that was always enjoyable. To, those to are really those. satisfying to watch, too. You know, as a viewer, yeah. that's yeah. really sad, you know, because you, you also spent time you know, on the flip side of get, going to love characters over time. You grow to really <laughs> hate people <laughs> over a period of time, too. So when they really when, when you finally get the thing that you've been wanting all along, it's also deeply, deeply satisfying. Mm -hmm. Um. I got to do a monologue once where the, the character who was killed was not uh, a, was not a significant character on True Blood, but uh, I got to have Dennis O'Hare kill a newscaster on live uh, television, and and then deliver a speech which I just cribbed essentially from network. Uh, I I didn't <laughs> copy the lines from network. It was it was the delivery and the style of that of of, of Ned Beatty's monologue, and. Uh, and I also knew Dennis O'Hare would just kill it. I mean, he, he, he would, he would be, you know, and it was fun and campy and, you know, but th that, that was one of those things that I was looking forward to, you know, the day we we're going to shoot it because, it, you know, you were in the hands of an amazing actor who was going to do something incredible. I, I think yeah, for me on, it, yeah. on, uh, on the, at the end of Battle of Bastards, when Sophie six the, six the half, uh, you know, on the bastard, she does a walk away. You don't really actually see the death. You see some of it in the background, um, but you don't really see the death. But what you do see is Sophie's smile uh, or Sansa's smile. And it was all in one shot. And we did it, you know, seven times or something. And I just remember standing there with Dan. And when she finally got, like, she nailed it on the seventh or eighth time. Mm -hmm. And it was just that feeling of, like, that's such, that's so epic. I mean, Sophie was so good, and when she when she got that shot, I just felt like that's I can now die happy. Maybe I should have died happy right then. <laughs> I peaked. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and this is obviously look, it, it's Netflix, so of course, ninety nine percent of Netflix is the binge model. Um, was there ever discussion of any kind of different delivery system? Because some have done it in batches. Stranger Things have done, you know, kind of split up seasons. Were you? Did you always want to do it this way, or was there some? Debate? When we went, when we went into it, we we all went into it at the time that we we signed up and started working with those guys. It was still very much all. On, on the binge model and so that you know that was fine that was what we we knew it going in and we planned accordingly somewhere in the midst you know in the midst of the uh, years it took to actually get the show made they started opening up to the idea of of different ways of of dropping seasons whether you're breaking them in half or breaking them into three parts or even you know, even a week by week thing. I'm not sure they've done that yet. But by that time with this show, we'd already kind of built it to be right. watched, you know, watch at your own pace and and not not broken up with time spent in, in between. And we, I think that with this one, it actually does. I'm, I'm at least speaking for myself. I'm pretty happy to have it all at once. I think it works well for this show um, going Going forward, if we end up doing more of it, who knows whether or not we'll stick with this or go to something that's maybe maybe more like what Stranger Things did. But uh, for this season, it, it's uh, it was always thought of as a as an all at once show, so we wrote it that way. Um, I like calling it a delivery system, though. I like the idea of it like a hypodermic needle, like gives you, <laughs> yeah. you know, one episode. Take your medicine, and you'll like it. Mm -hmm. Keep you alive. Yeah, exactly. Um, an amazing ensemble in this. You're you're sadly missing one president of the United States. I know. I just heard uh, President Obama was approached. He's he's a noted mm -hmm. fan of Three Body Problem. Do I take it he was going to be playing President Barack Obama in the stretch of a lifetime? Yeah, what was the idea. Was there yeah. a seat? He rejected was us. He rejected us flat out. <laughs> no negotiation. He was, nice. he was very nice about it. He was very. He it was a. Uh, it was a, my favorite rejection letter I'll ever get. <laughs> Do you have a favorite? Many. <laughs> by the end of Thrones, where people must have been throwing themselves at you to do cameos. Did you reject a lot of people by the last season? Oh, um, I don't know. Usually, when, when, when should have. Usually, when people, <laughs> if someone was willing to come all the way out there and like put on armor and roll around in the mud, we were like, sure, why not? Okay. 
You know when you're at a family gathering and you feel the need to bend the truth to impress a loved one, an aunt, an uncle, yeah, the job's going great, yeah, the relationship's going great, you're bending the truth just to make it all more comfortable? That should not be the situation in your doctor's office, guys. You should not have to feel like you are cutting any corners. That's why our sponsor, ZocDoc, is so important. This is the place where you can find and book doctors who will make you feel comfortable and actually listen to you. And we're not talking about just a few doctors. They have tens of thousands of doctors with verified patient reviews so you can make sure the vibes are all great and you're always comfortable with that very important person in your life. Yes, your doctor. With ZocDoc, you've got more options than you know. Plus, you can search by location, availability, and insurance. So there are literally no compromises here because with ZocDoc, you've got all the options at your fingertips. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare highly rated in-network doctors near you and instantly, instantly book appointments with them online. If I needed a doctor, ZocDoc would be there for me. Go to ZocDoc.com slash happy sad, download the ZocDoc app for free, then find and book a top rated doctor today. That's ZocDoc.com slash happy sad, ZocDoc.com slash happy sad. I'm going to go on record here. I'm, uh, maybe I'll alienate my own audience, but I'm going to say uh, I love the ending of Lost and I love the ending of Game of Thrones. OK, I'm just I'm not saying it just because you guys are here. <laughs> I've lost all my fans, but it's Thank true. <laughs> it was totally worth losing all of your fans. To say it that. is. Yeah. Just to make you guys happy for 30 yeah, seconds. Yeah, um, totally. Were, were you taken aback by the discourse? Did you see it coming? I think we knew it would be controversial. I, I think we hoped that it would be a little more 50 50. <laughs> you know, you, you, I think you hope for like a better proportion of definitely didn't want it to be quite so much hate. We're prepared for some of it, but you know. I guess I hadn't yeah. really taken into account the network yeah. effects, you know, which is the network effects that can help a show when they're working in your favor is a positive feedback loop that I kind see. of. The happens. exponential, and, and that, just like feeding on each is. other. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think that's what, that's what, what I was maybe referring to before when I was like, it's, it's hypocritical to, to love it when the, the, it's blowing in your direction and to, and to decide it's the end of the world when it's going the other way. But it's, it's like, yeah, I think that maybe that was the part of it that we hadn't really accounted for in, in knowing that some people were going to like it and some people weren't. David, is this why you're on the move right now that Game of Thrones fans are chasing you uh, yes. because of the ending? It's like Hard Day's Night, except they have, they have blades <laughs> and hammers. But to your Sorry point, to noise, but I will say the only positive moment I've ever had with Homeland Security was going through LAX a few months ago. And the guy saw my driver's license and he said, he's like, are you, are you Dave and Dan? I was like, what? I'm one of yes, I'm one of David. <laughs> like, I love the final season. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. So it was a really sweet moment in in a situation where you're not expecting sweetness. So there are people out there who like the last season. You're not the only one. There are like there, eleven of you. Yeah, I was going to say to quote Arrested Development, there are dozens of us. We exist. <laughs> Um, I, it must, I would imagine it, uh, I know this is a project that you probably can't say much of because it's never going to happen, presumably, or maybe not, but like, I know you guys were going to do Star Wars for a bit. That must've been a thrill just to, I don't know, dip your toe into that world for a while. I'm just curious, like how far down the road did you get? Did you have a script? Did you have the trilogy mapped out? We had, uh, we had, we, I think we, we got relatively far story-wise with the first one. And like he had kind of a basic roadmap for the other two, and yeah, it was it was it was a shame. I mean, it's just the truth is that our Hollywood's ratio or, or batting average on things conceived to things um, yeah. actually finished is has never been tremendously high, and there are always going to be ones that that get away for various reasons, you know, the ones that just aren't meant to be. So 
yeah, it was it was sad that that was one of them for us. But it's it's just you kind of as time goes on, you just kind of need to let go of those things because if you don't, you'll drive yourself completely crazy. So, is there some awkwardness at all that James Mangold is tackling a story that sounds somewhat similar to what you guys were tackling? Sorry, is there some? Is there some what, Josh? Well. The fact that I mean, has there been conversation? Because that was roughly the pitch, no? Like the beginnings of the Jedi, the dawn of the Jedi. I I, I, I love Jim. He's a great dude. So I go with all the best of luck to him. You know, fair, fair enough. So, um, where are you guys at right now? Look, we're 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 approaching the the dropping of these first eight episodes, of the first season. You have two more books to adapt. Um, this is not something you can just like jump into and be like, oh, let's just dash off eight more scripts. So how far along are you in terms of figuring out what the next two seasons are? We're, we're, we have a pretty good idea of what a, a next season, hopefully we have a next season. We, we, you know, we don't want to count any chickens of, of any kind. Mm -hmm. um, um, you shouldn't count chickens at all. You Tony, generally. Like, don't, people out there no like let other people do that I, you know, we're not chicken farmers <laughs> um uh but we have a, an idea of, of a, a, a good idea and a framework of what of, of what season two would be how that kind of maps to where the books are beyond that it gets a little bit hazier you know um i mean there are concepts even you know going forward that we're like well, i don't know how we're going to do that like we 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 will we'll have to hopefully we'll, it'll, be, it'll be a good problem to have if we get to the point where we have to figure out some of these things then you know we'll know we've gotten that far and get to get to maybe the end of the story which would be fantastic um it's a it's you know it's certainly the 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 season right in front of us would be is 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 i think uh something that we have a, a strong idea about past that you know hopefully we get there and we'll have a chance to figure the next one out definitely definitely here's hoping okay i'm going to add end with a little bit of a rapid fire we end the happy sad confused conversations with our profoundly random questions any of you can jump into any of these uh are you guys harry potter or lord of the rings guys we're talking books or movies Either way you want to go. Lord of the Rings was more for me, just because that's what that's like kind of one of the things that built me as a kid. So foundational material. Yeah. yeah. As a as a child, Lord of the Rings, but you know, as a parent, um, watching the Harry Potter movies with my kids was mm -hmm. a lot of fun. So I would say Tolkien shaped me and and I'm I'm now misshapen, but um but it, it was great fun watching Harry Potter with, with my three kids. Nice. I, I read six of the seven books to my oldest son out loud which was actually very nice a lot of i had fond memories of that I feel the I same way about harry potter yeah. yeah yeah totally uh i take it star wars over star trek or is there love for both for me star wars all the way i was more of a star wars person although i did the original star trek uh i was i was very into as a kid yeah uh star wars though i i you know I'm friends with George Takei, so I I, I, gotta, I, I can't hold that against him. Got to represent. Oh my! Oh my! Is there is there a movie any of you are, are embarrassed to admit you've never seen? Birth of a Nation. Well, I think you're okay. <laughs> you're good. You're good out. Um, I feel like you know what? I don't think I've ever seen all of Sound of Music. Huh. <laughs> Come There's over to movie my that house where my daughter watches musicals on loop. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like there was a French movie that was voted the number one movie ever by someone, by some like it. cinema magazine. Oh, it's the, the name Chantal of Chantal Ackerman. Yeah, yeah. Jean Delma. Uh, I'm, I'm losing it. Yeah. Jean, it's like Jean Demage and then her address. Right. It's Chantal, Chantal, Chantal Ackerman movie. movie. Yeah. Look at us posers. Or I won't, I won't spoil the end for you. It's pretty. <laughs> It's a slow burn, but it it, it, it gets there eventually. Uh, actor who makes you happy in the spirit of happy, sad, confused. An actor that always makes you happy. Mm -hmm. Liam Walsh. Cunningham. Liam Cumming Cunningham <laughs> for David. M. Emmett Walsh. Nice. Dan? Um, I do 
always love seeing and try not to name our own actors because of them that I start to divide divide loyalties. Who's an actor that always makes me happy? Uh, Steve Buscemi. Nice. A uh, movie that makes you sad? Sad. I mean, on the waterfront? Yeah. Cool. You guys can oh, you pass. Know, uh, breaking the waves really oh. crushed me at the end. Sorry, I'm probably not allowed to have two answers. Mm. That's okay. I'll take one of your answers. Fair enough. Uh, this is a Bruder film. Yeah. Wow. I've seen it. I've seen oh, it so yeah. times, and it gets me every time. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, a food that makes you confused, gentlemen. You just don't get it. What's the deal with a that? Food. A food that makes you confused. Yep. Uh, pineapple on pizza. I never really got. I know people like it. Never, never made sense to me. Yeah. We'll accept it. Alex, uh, flaming hot everything. Like, <laughs> just like, not everything has to be flaming hot. <laughs> oh, it needs to have a coating, a chemical red coating to make it delicious, Alex. No, you don't get it. <laughs> David, finish strong. Food that makes you confused. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to finish strong. I feel like I had two sad movies, so can I? Uh, uh, I've got nothing. Pineapple on pizza is a good answer. It's okay. bizarre. People really do that. It feels like something that people do just to be like, People, people culture. order it. I've seen it ordered and eaten. <laughs> just not by me. I'm just relieved. I'm sure we're Rocco in a in a sushi bar, and you were not confused by that. What happened? Chiraco. cod milt. Oh my oh, son's yeah. worm sack of a cod. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had that. Yeah, curd. Not... Wait, we're talking about curds. Well, that no, no the the, the cod. Cod spur. I didn't oh, you. but I actually liked that. I had that yeah. recently in Japan. Yeah, I that's it was pretty. Good. Yeah, no, that's good. I well, agree. It sounds disgusting, but it was good. Let's just end on a happy note. David has found safe haven. The cops did not find him. He's okay. No. We're all safe in our, in our respective safe places. Um, I, I did think about if I had been murdered uh, on the street of LA during your podcast, like that's how it, that's the only way I'd be remembered. Really, is oh yeah, well, that's I would. The guy who got I don't shot didn't want to go. I didn't want to go there, but it would have been great for the show. Great content. I mean, great really content for three body calm and happy. Sad confused would have been a big win for all we, of us. We can't buy that kind of publicity. <laughs> you want to run back out into the street and take one for the team, buddy? <laughs> you do. Do you have a few seconds left. There's time yet. <laughs> I would I would do it, but there's just it's not going to happen. In this Come room. on, there's still two of you to show run the show. There are two. That's why you have three. So you have an extra. That's true. Yeah. There should be a good three body pawn right here. <laughs> I just feel like it's just waiting for somebody. <laughs> three body problem is the show. Fair I don't know if we convinced fair. anybody to see it, but we we did our best, guys. Uh, congratulations, um, right. epic in every possible way. I hope you guys get to do more of this. Uh, and thanks so much for the time, everybody. Really appreciate thanks it. Thanks so much, Josh. Thanks so much, you, Josh. Appreciate it. And so ends another edition of Happy, Sad, Confused. Remember to review, rate, and subscribe to this show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm a big podcast person. I'm Daisy Ridley, and I definitely wasn't pressured to do this by Josh. <laughs>